the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how do we actually be people characterized by love. If Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God and love other people, then how do we actually live our lives in alignment to that commandment? So the first week, I talked about that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us. It's available to us. That how we live in love is that God actually empowers us to live in love. That God makes it possible for us to not only uh, be in, live empowered lives, but makes it possible for us to choose Jesus and to choose life. That God's power makes it possible for us to choose to follow <coughs> Jesus, which is the best decision we can ever make. And that when we follow Jesus, we're actually able to make better decisions. If you remember this week, I talked about that humans make 35,000 decisions every single day. And if you're like me, sometimes you tend to make more bad decisions than good decisions. But when we choose Jesus, Jesus makes it possible for us to choose life, to make better decisions. And so today, I want to talk about giftedness, of being gifted. So to talk about this, we're going to um, begin reading in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So if you have your Bibles with you, or you can grab one from the back of the pew, and pull those out and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading in verse 11 in just a few moments. So as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 4, I want to tell you a story. So a couple of weeks ago, um, my husband Chris was seated on the blue couch in our living room watching television. Chris uh, would tell you, if he was here today, that he enjoys watching television. It's one of his hobbies. He likes watching Netflix. It's a way that he can relax from the stresses of the week. I actually don't really enjoy watching television that much. It's not really one of my hobbies. Um, and so this particular night, Chris was watching one of his favorite shows, America's Got Talent. Some of you, I'm sure, have probably seen this show before, and so you can uh, relate to it and you know what this show is about. Well, Chris is in the living room watching America's Got Talent, and I'm just kind of like bopping around the house, like cleaning up from the day, making lunches for the next day, preparing to get ready to go to bed, and I'm still not exactly sure what happened, but all of a sudden, there was like this strong gravitational pull to the living room, and all of a sudden, I find myself seated on the couch next to Chris watching America's Got Talent. And I'm like captivated watching one incredible act after another. And I mean, I can barely believe my eyes and my ears, some of these incredibly gifted performers that you're watching. And then you hear their stories and you're like trying not to cry when you like hear where they came from and like somebody invited them to like try out for the show and they actually made it and now they're like living into a dream of their lifetime to perform on national television and you're like praying like Simon, please be nice to them, please don't crush this person, can't you see how incredibly gifted and talented they are? You know, so I'm sure many of you have seen this show before, have you seen America's Got Talent? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about, right? So we're watching this show and I'm just captivated by it. And I began to realize that I think one of the reasons America's Got Talent and shows like it, like the voice of American Idol, are so addictive and so popular, it's because I think we as humans, we like to see the giftedness in other people. We like to see the talent in others and to identify that and to see people use the gifts that they have. I mean, think about it. We do this for kids all the time. So you might uh, have a child or a grandchild, and maybe you're sitting down doing homework with them, and you realize that they can just complete it super quickly. And you're like, wow, like I was still working on that math problem, and they already finished it because they're so bright, right? Or you might see this gift of intelligence in them, and you go to their teacher, and the teacher's like, yeah, like I see this gift too. And, and maybe the teacher's willing to give them some extra homework or some more challenging work. Maybe you might even advocate that they'll skip a grade or that they'll take advanced classes in high school, go to the best college, right? You're going to do the best that you can to help this child know the gift of intelligence that they have and help them develop it and, and use it. And we do this not just with intelligence, but with all sorts of gifts, right? If we see a kid who has great athletic ability, we're going to encourage them to try out for the sports team. Or a kid with great musical ability, we want them to uh, take music lessons and be part of the band or the choir. And what I think one of the reasons we do this is because we can see that their gift has the potential not just to bless that person who has the gift, but to bless the whole world. Right? We see this like when a, uh, a gifted athlete joins a sports team, often the whole sport team, sports team improves and gets better. Or when a gifted musician joins the band or the choir, the whole group gets better. And when we see that kid with that really brilliant mind, we realize 
that's power. Like that child has a gift that can bless the whole world. Like maybe their brain will be the brain that solves some of these huge problems that we have in the world, like solves world peace or cures cancer. And so we want them to see and use their gift so that it can be a blessing to the whole world. And the good news is, is that no matter how young or old we are, all of us have gifts. All of us have different talents and abilities that we are naturally good at. For some of us, that might be leadership or teaching or working with numbers or parenting or cooking or crocheting or mowing the grass. Like there's all sorts of different things that we are good at, that we're gifted at. And so Paul, when he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he knows that they have many gifts. In fact, I think we talked a little bit about this previously, that Ephesus was a pretty powerful city. It was a port city located in modern day Turkey. It was also a capital city, so you had lots of politicians. Aww. You had a lot of business men and women. You had a lot of artists and art uh, people skilled in architecture. So you would have had this church, this congregation, was very gifted. But when Paul came to them and, and wrote this letter, what he told them is he didn't point out their gifts in politics or in art. Instead, Paul pointed out their spiritual gifts that Jesus had given them. So I want to look at these spiritual gifts this morning. So this is Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11. The gifts that Jesus gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. Paul is saying to this church in Ephesus that you have been given spiritual gifts, that Jesus has given you these gifts, that these gifts are not just church leadership positions. They aren't offices in the church that some of you will aspire to be a part of. No, these are gifts that have been given to you. And so Jesus needs you to see and recognize the gifts that you've been given so that you can use them. Why? Why should you use your gifts? Paul says you use your gifts to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And body of Christ is the code word for the church. And so Paul is saying you use your gifts to equip the church. The Greek word that we translate to get the word equip is the word katarisma. The word katarismon literally means to set in place. It's the word like if you had broken your arm and you had to have surgery or a cast, that is katarismon, to set it back into place. Or if your joint was out of socket, katarismon would be pop it back in place, you set it in place. So Paul is creating this picture of the body of Christ needing to be set back into place. Because Paul is saying, if you guys don't know and don't use your spiritual gifts, then the whole body is out of joint and broken. I mean, you can picture what a body would look like with many broken bones or many joints out of place, and you might even kind of wince in pain when you think about that. And Paul is saying that's what the church is like if you guys don't know what your gifts are and if you don't use them. Paul says you need to see the gifts that have been given to you from Jesus, and you need to use them so that you can set, equip the church in place so that the church can be functional in the world today. In fact, I think one of the reasons why the church isn't often nearly as effective as maybe many of us would like to see it in the world today is because I think so many of us don't often realize that we have these spiritual gifts. And because we don't know that we're gifted, then we don't use these gifts so that we can't set the body of Christ in place if we don't know and use our gifts. That the body of Christ, the church, can't be what it ought and could be unless we know and use our spiritual gifts. And so like a child who we identify has a gift and we see that them using their gift that blesses maybe the sports teams they're a part of or maybe even blesses the whole world, Paul needs us to see the gifts that we've been given so that we can build up the body of Christ. Paul continues on in verse 14. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But 
speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Paul is saying that you need to no longer be children. He's like, there was a time when you were infants in the faith, when you were young children, when people had to call out these gifts in you, that they had to share with you Jesus' story, to tell you the good news of Jesus who came to show us how to live a perfect life in relationship with God and one another, but that Jesus, under the weight of all of our sin and brokenness, died. But thankfully, that wasn't the end of the story, that three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead and conquered and defeated sin and death, so that sin and death no longer have the final victory, but that life and love are going to win. And because of Jesus, we have this incredible hope that we can experience abundant life now and for all eternity. Paul is saying, this is where you started, that you learned the good news about Jesus, but now I need you to grow up in your faith. I need you not just to be spoon-fed by the Christian leaders, but I need you to start to work on and develop your own faith and your own relationship with Jesus. We've talked about this before, but it's similar. Our spiritual health is similar to our physical health. When you lift weights, you're, you start to get stronger. And when we do different, to use different tools like prayer and reading scripture, our spiritual muscles get stronger. And when you work on building up one muscle, often the other muscles next to it get stronger. And so as you develop and grow up and strengthen in your faith, other people around you get stronger and grow up in their faith. And they begin to build up the body of Christ. And Paul's saying, I need you to see and use your gift so that you can grow up and mature in your faith and become stronger, that you will strengthen others around you to build up the body of Christ. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, and I believe is what Paul is saying to us today. That we need to know and recognize our spiritual gifts so that we can build up the church, so the church can be about the work of Jesus in the world, of helping people come to know and follow Jesus, of reconnecting them with God who loves them so much of being Jesus' hands and feet in the world, of making disciples who will come to know and follow Jesus. That this is the work that God is asking us to do. And that as we do this, we too will grow up in our faith. So the question is, how do we do this? What are some of our spiritual gifts? So I want to look briefly at these five different spiritual gifts. And you'll see in your bulletin that I've included them. Uh, for you under the message notes section. So I've, I've listed out briefly what they are, but I'm going to explain them a little more and left you a little space to feel free to jot down any other thoughts that I might offer that stand out to you. And after I've briefly explained all of these um, different gifts, I'm going to ask you to circle which one that you think most resonates with you. So if you had to pick one of the five, which one would you pick? So we're going to start with apostles. Apostles are ministry pioneers. The word uh, apostle in Greek literally means sent out. So the apostles were sent out to start new churches, new faith communities, new ministries. And so you might be an apostle if you consider yourself an explorer or an entrepreneur. If you like dreaming, if you like new things, if you like challenges or change. Uh, you might be an a apostle. If you are always asking the question, are God's people living into their destiny? So that's the apostle. The second one is prophet. A prophet is someone who hears from God. So you might be a prophet if you enjoy spending time alone listening to God speak to you. You might be a prophet if you feel like you can zoom out and see the bigger picture in ways maybe others can't see it. Maybe you can offer creative solutions to problems that other people don't always see. You might be a prophet if you enjoy spending time alone with God. If you are a prophet, you often find yourself asking the question, are God's people hearing God's voice? Those are the prophets. The third is evangelists. Evangelists are those who like to share the good news of Jesus' story. You might be an evangelist if you uh, enjoy hanging out with non-Christians. You might be an evangelist if you like reminding other Christians that there still are people who don't yet know and follow Jesus in the world. 
It might be an evangelist if you like sharing your faith and telling others about your relationship with Jesus. You might have found yourself in a profession such as being a salesperson or in politics or in public relations. This is the gift of being an evangelist. And the question you often ask is, are more people entering into God's kingdom? The next is pastor. Pastor comes from the same word as shepherd. So it's somebody who shepherds or takes care of other people. You might have the gift of being a pastor if you uh, enjoy hospitality, if you are able to show compassion to other people, if you can see a need and empathize with somebody and try to help, and help meet that need or offer encouragement in someone's time of need. You might be a good listener, somebody uh, who somebody opens up to and trusts about some of the stories of their life. You might find yourself in some of the helping professions, such as being a nurse or a social worker or a counselor. The question that you often ask is, are God's people showing compassion? The last gift is teacher. Teachers are somebody who study and apply scripture. Uh, you might be a teacher if you love reading scripture, if you love trying to apply it to your life and helping other people apply it to their lives. You like trying to make scripture relevant to other people. And the question you're always asking is, are God's people immersing themselves in scripture? So these are the five spiritual gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And so I want you to look at those on your bulletin for a moment and just circle one that most stands out to you. Don't be shy or timid. These are gifts that God has given you, and maybe you might not resonate that strongly with any of them, but if you had to choose, which of the five would you choose? And I just invite you to circle that at this time. Then you'll see under that, I've listed some additional spiritual gifts. A couple weeks ago, we did a spiritual gift survey, and so many of you might remember some of your spiritual gifts from that. And so I encourage you to look over that list and circle any of those spiritual gifts that you think you might have been given. If you want to find out more about your spiritual gifts, I've listed two websites. One, the five-fold survey, is for these five spiritual gifts that we talked about this morning. And the other one is for the additional spiritual gifts. But I want to encourage us, actually, to circle our spiritual gifts. And I want us to think about that question I posed there at the bottom. What is the one thing you can do this week to use your spiritual gifts? If Paul says to the church in Ephesus, we need to know what our spiritual gifts are, and then we need to use them to build up the body of Christ and for us to mature, what is one way that you could use your spiritual gift? So I'm actually going to encourage you to take like two minutes with a partner next beside you, circle your spiritual gifts, or at least have an idea of what you think they might be, and talk amongst yourselves about what your gifts are and about an idea of using your spiritual gifts this week. So go ahead and talk amongst yourselves for about two minutes.
are some ideas that emerge? What are some of the things we're going to do this week to use our spiritual gifts? Yeah, Justin. Well, I'm listening, so you don't want to I think gets me this pastor, and I was telling Eddie, um, with the meals on wheels, with the you know, partner and I, we used to try to make our, not everybody's talking, but a lot of them do want to talk, and we don't have a lot of time, but just, you know, how do you engage, do you look nice, and just those kinds of little things. <coughs> My mother being in the nursing home now for close to a year, I've, you know, learned to know other people that are in there. So again, some are talkative, some are not, but as far as, you know, just going up to them, hey, Betty, how are you today? How are you? You know, that's for sure. Just little things like that, knowing that their days can be pretty long as mm -hmm. in there, so. That's great. So using your gift of being a pastor to encourage others, especially when they're in need and they don't often have <coughs> other interaction with other people. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Good. Other examples. Hope and I talked about that Hope also thinks she has the gift of pastoring, so how can she do that as a nurse this week of showing up to her right. passion? Yeah. Um, trying to see what the patient needs spiritually mm -hmm. as well as just physically. Great. And uh, trying to help them as much as possible um, without tying up religion, mm -hmm. so to speak, in it. But then I said to Pastor Hannah, maybe I should. Mm -hmm. When you think about uh, the things that happened yesterday in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, maybe that's exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. So it's my hope today that you're able to begin to see that the gifts that God has given you, that you are gifted in so many different ways. And it's my hope that you'll begin to see those gifts and begin to use them to build up, to set in place, to equip the church, the body of Christ, and for you to grow up and mature in your faith. So I challenge you to recognize your gifts and to live into it this week. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for the many gifts that you have given us. God, thank you for this opportunity this morning to begin to explore the gifts that you have given us. And so God, I just pray you would help us to see those gifts and help us to use them to build up your church and for us to grow up in our relationship with you. God, thank you for your love and your patience with us as we stumble and fall, as we have growing pains along the way. But God, we just pray that you would strengthen us each and every day to help us become more and more like your son Jesus. In whose name we pray.